I eat only one meal a day most of the days. One big meal I eat and that's it. And doctors telling me, no, no, Sadhguru, the way you're traveling, this will happen, that will happen, you must eat at least once in four hours, something you must eat. I said, leave me alone, I'm doing fine. But now, a big university in America comes up with this called intermittent fasting. It's not nonsense, it's good. But they rediscovered something that we have known forever. Now everybody is saying there must be a 16-hour gap. Then all your ailments will go away. What the hell were we saying all these thousands of years? The simple thing is, there are many, many aspects to this. Psychological, physiological. But now cancer is on the rise in the world. A cancerous cell is like a criminal in the society. All of us have in our bodies. Only if they become, their concentration becomes more than what they should be or they gang up and lo locate themselves in one place, they become like organized crime. There are pickpockets in Kochi, I'm sure. Hello? Then small time criminals, individually operating, operating in twos and threes. Uh, we don't take it very seriously, we leave it because it happens. But suppose all hundred of them got organized into your organized crime, now we will crack down. Because we know now it becomes a threat to the society. Similarly, cancerous cells are like this. Criminals, they are moving around, doing some damage. Their only problem is, right now, they are generally eating about 8 to 12 times more than what the other cells are eating. So if you just give sufficient break between one meal and the other, most of them will die because they cannot survive. This is something we've been talking forever. But now they've discovered it with a billion dollar research. Empty stomach and hunger are two different things. Hunger means your energy levels start dropping. But empty stomach is a good thing. In the yogic sciences, today modern science also is coming in line with this. But what we know by our experience, you will spend a billion dollars to come there. Because research is all about how many million dollars. That's how it is. Your body and your brain works at its best only when your stomach is empty. So we always make sure we eat in such a way, how much ever we eat, our stomach must be always empty within two to two and a half hours time maximum. So we go to bed hungry always. People think they cannot sleep. They can sleep. On an average, for 25 years on an average, I slept only two and a half to three hours. These days I'm getting little lazy and speaking, sleeping anywhere between three and a half to four and a half hours in spite of the level of travel that I have. When I say level of travel, if I say my level of travel in the next few days, you will fall off your chair. Because in the next 10 days, I'm in five different countries doing I don't know how many events, all kinds of events. So you are able to keep this up simply because you don't over eat. It's very, very important. Everybody eats two meals. I generally eat only one meal, 4.35 in the evening because I don't like to sit in front of the plate and worry about how much to eat. I like to eat well. So 4.35 in the evening if I eat a meal, it's only next day. Any correction and purification that needs to happen in the body, your stomach needs to be empty. It's very, very important. Otherwise, the purification on the cellular level will not happen. You pile up things and then you have all kinds of problems. If food is not good enough to be touched, I don't know how it's good enough to be eaten. The cleanliness of your hands is entirely in your hands. The cleanliness of the fork is not entirely in your hands and nobody else but you have used these hands as to how clean or not clean it is right now. The fork, you do not know who's used it, how they've used it, for what they used it and all they have to do is wipe it with a tissue and give it to you and it looks pretty clean. Above all, you don't feel the food. The first thing that's been taught to us is if food appears in front of you to hold your hands upon the food for a few moments just to feel how the food is. If something appears on my plate, if I just feel this, 
I know what to eat and what not to eat. What I should not eat, I don't taste it and then reject it. I just don't eat. Because my hands are the first level, not tasting in the sense the tongue tastes, but knowing the food. First thing is knowing the food. Uh, but the food that's going to become a part of you, first thing is your hands. Even if you physically don't touch it, just being conscious and being there, it clearly tells you how the food will behave within you. Whether this particular food on this particular day, should it go into you or not. Because every day your body is not the same thing. Every day, every moment it's different. If you feel the food, you just know whether this food has to go into you on this day or not. If that much awareness is brought in, we don't have to go on telling people what they should eat. Every meal they must decide what they should eat in that meal. There is no one prescription that this is what you should eat for your life. That will feel too claustrophobic that only this I can eat. Your selection of food and consumption of food also must happen consciously. More than what you eat, how you eat it is also equally important. When I say how you eat it, these are all life substances. Every one of them had a life of their own, whether it's a plant, animal, vegetable, every one of them had a life of their own. Now in some way, you are making food out of it, you must consume it with its utmost gratitude. If you approach it with a certain sense of gratitude and reverence towards the food that you eat, when I say reverence, it may feel like too much for you, but I'm asking you. Let's say we put you in a room and you had nothing to eat for five days. If God appears in front of you, what will you ask for? Food. So that's how important it is. You must understand the food on your plate is not just a substance. It is not a material. It is not a commodity. It is life. It is the life-making material for you. So you must treat it as such. Right now, when it's on the plate, when it's out there, it has no value. But the moment you consume it and it becomes your flesh and blood, now suddenly it's of immense value. Why do we live like this? It's very important when it comes on your plate itself, you must treat it as a part of yourself. With great reverence, you must consume. Just the way you consume it, if you change that, food will behave very differently within you. This is what consciousness means. If people say your consciousness has no impact on your life, only chemical structures have impact, I'm very sorry for them because that's not how life works. Human consciousness has a deep and profound impact on everything that we touch, especially the food that we are making another life as a part of ourselves. When we're doing such an act, it's very, very important we treat it with utmost gratitude and reverence. Habit means you are functioning unconsciously. If you are functioning unconsciously, that's a bad thing because the whole thing about being human is we are capable of doing things consciously. That is the beauty of being human, that we can do everything consciously. What an animal does unconsciously, we can do the same thing consciously. We can eat unconsciously or we can eat consciously. We can breathe unconsciously or we can breathe consciously. Everything that we can do, we can do it consciously. The moment we do something consciously, suddenly that human being looks very refined and wonderful. Just because somebody walks and speaks consciously, doesn't he become a beautiful human being? Yes or no? That's all. So why is it that we are trying to develop habits as if there is a good thing? Habit means fixed realities where you don't have to think. You get up in the morning and it will happen to you. No, don't try to automize your life. That is not efficiency, that is the efficiency of the machine. This one is supposed to function intelligently and consciously. Nobody is expecting it to function like a machine. So, about food and stuff, food must be suitable for the body that we eat. For It is for the body. This is a building material for this body, the food that you are eating. What is the appropriate food? Unfortunately, it is all messed up right now. Traditionally, we ate very sensible in this country. But these thousand years of innovations have brought other kinds of food cultures and today the national diet is pizza or pasta. What is it? Which is one? I don't know. Both were competing. 
So, we are losing our sense about food. It's definitely time to look at what is the most suitable thing. If I go into that food, it's a very long process. But uh, you must experiment with food, not just by the tongue, but by the body. You eat something today and see, just learn to observe how agile and how active your body feels after eating this food. If it feels like it wants to go to the grave, that's not good food. If it feels like it wants to be alive after eating this, except coffee. If you eat food and your body feels very agile and alive, that means it's good food, body is liking it. If you eat something, it feels dull, that means it's not liking it, it's having difficulty with it, that's why it feels dull. So just on this basis, there's a much, I mean this is a very simplistic way of putting it. We must understand this, food is not a religion, food is not a culture, food is just a fuel for this machine, yes? There may be cultural aspects to the tastes. There may be even religious tinge to the food over a period of time. But essentially food is fuel for this body. So with what kind of food will it function? Minimum struggle within itself and maximum impact. So suppose you buy a petrol car and pump diesel into it. It may still roll around but not at its optimum. Similarly, Various foods you can eat and still somehow it functions. But those communities which have eaten with care, you can clearly see a distinct difference in the way they function, the levels of intelligence and whatever. So in India, we prescribed food for different people in different way. If you're doing menial jobs, you eat one way because you need physical muscle. If you're doing other kinds of trading and other kinds of activities, you eat another way. If you are a fighting class, you eat differently. And now if you are into education, spiritual process and subtler aspects of life, then you eat differently. If you are in education, one of the greatest challenges is to stay focused on something. The goddamn textbook, the wonderful textbook that is written, is written for an average intelligence. It's a common prescription. It's not written for the brilliant student. It is written in a way that it's a common prescription, everybody gets it. But that textbook, how much effort it is taking for a whole lot of people. How they have to read it ten times to get it. But you lie down in your bed and read a love story, you remember every word. Yes or no? How come? So you don't lack memory, you don't lack focus. It is just that, Textbook and you, chemistry is not uh, working. <laughs> so, what you need is a higher level of focus, a higher level of involvement. And another great enemy for a student is, because this textbook is such a tranquilizer. The moment you open it, go to cinema till 2 a.m. you're up. Open the textbook at 9 o'clock. Right there, you smash into it. So, sleep is another big enemy. So what kind of food do you eat so there is no inertia in the body? In yogic way of seeing things, we are looking at tamas, rajas and sattva. Tamas means inertia. Rajas means activity but no balance. Sattva means absolutely balanced kind of energy. When you're in education, you need a very balanced kind of energy because you have to focus on something which doesn't naturally interest you. It's not something that with which your chemistry is gelling. If your chemistry is gelling, you are always focused on that one, isn't it? Here, there's no chemistry, but you have to focus on that. For this, you need a balance and a steady mind. For this, you need, need to eat in a certain way. To put it very simply, food goes through your body through the alimentary canal. From your mouth, to your anal outlet, there is a pipe. Through this it runs, going through various stages of digestive process. Many of you are biology people, right? It goes through the alimentary canal. Now it begins with the, the lip. Here, if you look at this, all the herbivores and carnivores. If you look at the animal kingdom, there are herbivores and carnivores, the two main segments of animals in the world. 
one eats vegetable matter another eats meat if you look at the alimentary canal the way it is built between herbivores and carnivores there's a distinct difference everything in the human being suggests that you are naturally a herbivore but for the sake of survival we became carnivores if you look at the moment jaw moment all the carnivorous animals have only cutting action herbivores have cutting and grinding action there are molars but carnivores don't have widespread molars they have just incisors canines and everything looks like cutting teeth all the herbivores do grinding what do you have both so you are supposed to chew your food why you are supposed to chew your food is that you have enzymes in your saliva where if you take a little bit of raw rice and put it in your mouth just for a minute you will see it turn sweet right here because right here so carbohydrate is being converted into sugar right here so if you eat properly then we say about 30 to 50% of your digestion should happen in your mouth so this part of the digestive system is expecting half digested food or partially digested food but right now the way we eating is mostly we are putting not only undigested food but partially destroyed food so the amount of food that you need to get the same amount of energy has increased you are eating much more food than what you should eat to generate that much of energy because of that there is inertia in the body because it has to process so much more food than what it should there is inertia once there is inertia your sleep quota increases see this is not that you must deny yourself sleep that's not the point but if you eat right and do a certain things with your body you see very effortlessly within 3 to 4 weeks you can drop your sleep quota anywhere between 2 to 3 hours 1 and 1/2 to 3 hours very easily you can drop if you just eat consciously and just learn to sit properly you know just the posture your geometry of the body and what goes into the system if you just manage these two things you will see sleep quota will just come down like that just to tell you for over 25 years i have largely managed with an average of 2 and 1/2 hours of sleep now i'm getting lazy and i'm sleeping averaging somewhere around 4 and 1/2 hours now but 7 days of the week okay 365 days non stop on 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 ev- almost every day my daughter didn't call me for a month i asked what the hell is the problem with you why are you not calling she said every 6 hours you are in the new city what the hell i'm supposed to do so i said okay and <laughs> which is true in one day sometimes we are doing three cities so it's a non stop activity and today many people around me have learned to do this over 100 150 people around me are doing this kind of activity averaging 4 hours sleep and 7 days of the week they're on 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 all the time and uh, they are not irritated they are not frustrated they're joyful and they're wonderful why this is this there are many aspects to this but one important aspect is food how you eat not only what you eat how you eat is also very important because food is a life thing one simple thing all you girls can do is just see various health issues and inertia issue focus issue just bring 40 to 50% of the food in its raw form that means it's alive it must be a live cell it can be a vegetable it can be a fruit it can be a nut it can be sprouted gram at least 40 to 50% the food that you eat must be alive you eat dead food and you want to live this is a little difficult thing to do because you have to raise the dead now but if you eat live food one thing you will see is the state of your mind your focus and your sleep quotas and above all staying awake is not good enough you have to stay alert isn't it how alert you are how focused you are only to that extent everything yields to you in this world isn't it so what is the level of focus will determine whether the world yields to you or not isn't it and one more aspect of life one more aspect of food is when you consume something it must be of a simple uh, genetic code in the sense it must be a very simple software vegetables fruits nuts sprouts they are very simple 
More complicated means animal food becomes more and more complicated. Suppose you eat an animal which has some amount of emotion and a life of its own. Now the code in that we were talking about this, your body is just an accumulation of memory, which means a certain software, isn't it? This is the most complex software. Human software is the most complex software on the planet of all the creatures. So if you eat an animal, particularly a mammal, if you eat, it has a similar kind of complexity, maybe not as complex as this, similar level of complexity because it has thought and emotion of its own. Now for you to break that code and integrate it into your system, you are not fully successful. So it will leave traces of certain qualities within you. You cannot break that code and make it a part of yours because it's a different and complex code. If you eat a leaf, a vegetable, a fruit, a nut or a sprout, this is much simpler. If you must eat non-vegetarian food, you must eat that which is furthest away from you. So generally, fish and water life is furthest away from you. So if you must eat non-vegetarian food, the best thing to eat is uh, you have a you are on the coast. <laughs> fish is the best thing to eat that way. <laughs>